My name is Dave Nave. Russell A. Koff brought new insights into managing the interactions between the parts of a company rather than managing the behavior of each part individually. He called this approach systems thinking, and his insights are a tremendous contribution to business and society. On behalf of the Deming Cooperative, we are pleased to make these videos available to you for your continued learning. All this he agreed all the way through. He came to the end and said, now we want to drop the bottom 4% minimally. He said, you can't do it. Why not? You just agreed with everything we said. He said, I'm going to teach you a lesson, he said. He said, what's the product at the bottom of your list? So we un unfolded all this paper and said it was item 49J65. He said, I didn't ask you the number. He said, what kind of paper was it? He said, I don't know. What the whole difference does it make? Shook his head. He said, you're going to be hard to educate. He said, let me start over. Who bought that paper last year? So I looked. I said, you made one sale. And I went to account 952-53. I didn't ask you the number. He said, who bought the paper? I said, look, I don't have to be a genius to know that's irrelevant. What I know is this. You sold two pounds of that paper last year. The smallest quantity you can produce on the assembly line is 2,000 pounds. I said, you know how many years supply of paper you have at two pounds a year? He said to me, you do have to be a genius to think that way. And it's all wrong. So well, what's wrong? He said, you ever hear of Claire Booth loose? He said, sure, I heard of Claire Booth loose. Who is she, he said. He said, she's a playwright, known most for the play she wrote on Broadway. She's also mixed up in politics and the women's liberation movement. He said, very good. He said, you know whether she's married or not? I said, yeah. He said, who's she married to? I said, Henry Luce. He said, very good. He said, you know what he does for a living? Yeah, he's chairman of Time, Life, and Fortune. Great, he said. You also know that he's our largest customer, that he bought $44 million worth of paper from this company last year. And you think I'm not going to give his wife a lousy two pounds of letter paper and run the risk of losing his business? He said, don't be stupid. That's not the lesson we learned. I'm used to that kind of stuff. So being a good academic, we asked him the academic question. How do you know if you don't give her the two pounds of letter paper, you're going to lose $44 million worth of business from time, life, and fortune? And then I learned the lesson. He said, I don't know. You can be damn sure I'm not going to try to find out. <laughs> See, what was he saying? The risk is not worth it. So we left with a, you know, like a dog that had been beaten, our tail between our legs. God, we were frustrated because scheduling did not seem the right way to deal with the problem. So what occurred to us was a wonderful principle in science that we very seldom use, unfortunately. It's called Hitch's Principle. Charles Hitch was president of the University of California after spending years at the Rand Corporation. And in a rare moment of clarity, he made the following statement. If you can't solve the problem you're facing, you must be facing the wrong problem. That's a wonderful principle. So we said, maybe we've got the problem wrong. What are we trying to do? We're trying to reduce the number of products that have to be made. We've assumed that the only way of doing that is to reduce the product line. We no sooner said that, we saw another way of doing it. We redesigned the compensation system for salesmen. The salesmen were paid a fixed salary plus a percentage of the dollar value of what they sold. We designed a new system which gave them a commission, same commission, no commission on the unprofitable products, but an increased commission on the profitable products so that if next year they sold the same thing they sold this year, they would get the same income. If they sold less of the unprofitable products, it would make no difference in their income. More of the profitable products, their income would go up. We showed this to the production manager. He said, that's kind of cute. But I don't control salesman compensation. He said, that's personnel. He said, well, you go talk to them. They don't try to run production. So he went to see the production manager. He thought it was a good idea, so he put it on trial in one of the five regions that the United States was divided into. In the next six months, 65% of the products in the product line were not sold. Profitable product sales went up by 18%. Salesman income increased by 225%. Corporate profit doubled. 
and the improvement in production was four and a half times what you could get with perfect scheduling and a perfect forecast. What kind of a problem was it? Is it a production scheduling problem, a product line design problem, or a salesman compensation problem? It's none of them. But if you understand the way the parts interact, you know which way to go into the system to get the effect that you want in the easiest and most economical and effective way. So stop thinking about problems as falling into categories. There's only people that do, but problems don't. Democratization, we said, is a requirement. This requires that you understand what democracy is. I once took a graduate class and asked each one of them to take a clean sheet of paper and, and define democracy. There were about 45 people in the class and we got 45 different definitions. We thought that was funny because this was the year in which we were celebrating the 200th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, it was 1776 to 1976. So we decided we ought to spend some time finding out what democracy is. And we finally reached consensus in the class. And it was democracy involved three conditions. First, anyone who's affected by a decision has a voice in making that decision. So it's the participatory principle. Secondly, that all those who individually have authority over others is subject to the collective authority of the others. So a boss who has 10 subordinates can control the future of any one of those subordinates taken separately, but they collectively can control his future. No manager can hold his job without the approval of his subordinates in a democracy but no subordinate can hold his job without the approval of a superior. And the third condition is anybody can do whatever they want to do, providing it doesn't affect anybody else. There's no such thing as a victimless crime. But if you want to do something that does affect somebody else and they agree to it, you can do it. But if they don't agree to it, you can't. Those are the three necessary conditions for democracy. And the question now was, what do you have to do to a corporation to make it democratic and what will the effect be? This led to something that some, many of you know, let me, I don't want to run ahead. It involves the creation of boards for every manager. Every manager is given a board which consists of himself, his boss, and his immediate subordinates, and any others they want to enter. And those boards are given responsibility for all planning and policy making and coordination and integration of plans and policies across the board. They become the principal instrument for strategic planning and decision making in the corporation. No manager can hold his job, his position, not his job, without the approval of his subordinates. But no subordinate can hold his job without the approval of his superior. So you get the democratic principle operating. Now, those boards, which I don't have time to go into in detail here, literally transform the culture of an organization. And let me just give you a quick illustration of how. The subordinates on any board have a responsibility to meet at least once a year to answer the following question. What can my boss do that will enable me to do my job better? Notice, I'm not saying what can I do to do to help to, to have him do his job better. What can he do to make me do my job better? They then will meet face to face with the boss and make these proposals. And he has three options. He can say, yes, I'll do it. No, I won't. But if he says that, he must give the reasons so that it's understood. They don't have to agree, but they have to understand. Or he can say, give me more time and I'll come back to you. And he's given up to a month to come back with a yes or a no. I'll give you some examples in a moment. When that's completed, my boss then says, here's what I want you subordinates to do that will enable me to do my job better. Notice, he's not telling them how to do their job better, but what they can do to enable him to do his job better. Now, if you look at that, you're producing a collaboration between people at two different levels, each enabling the other to do their jobs better. It's a collaborative relationship instead of a hostile one. It completely changes the culture. I can give you all kinds of examples. One of the ones I enjoy the most is uh, Anheuser-Busch. 
We created the first board for August Bush, the CEO. It consisted of 11 vice presidents and August, and I was a facilitator. So after a couple months, the subordinates met separately without August present, and I facilitated the meeting. And they came up with 18 suggestions as to what August should do that would enable the vice presidents to behave more effectively. We then met in a boardroom with August. I should explain that I started to work with August Bush when he was 19 years old, so we grew up together. And he's a very old personal friend that has something to do with what happened. Because the group decided I would present the suggestions to August rather than them, because he couldn't fire me. <laughs> so we met in the boardroom and I explained what we had done. I said, August, the first item on our list is vacations. He immediately broke in. What the hell are you talking about? He said, vacation. We have one of the best vacation policies in the United States. <clears throat> Everyone in this room is entitled to six weeks of vacation. If they don't take it, while they work during the time they could take vacation, they get double pay. They've got five airplanes they can use to get to where they want to go with their families. They've got three cottages, north, central, and south, that they can use for vacations. They've got two ocean-going vessels and three speedboats. What the hell else do they want, he said. I said, oh, he didn't let me finish. He said, what else is there to say? I said, there's a question to ask. Like what? I said, how many weeks did you take last year, August? Oh, he said, last year we had that price war with Miller. I couldn't take a vacation. I, maybe I took a weekend. He said, what about the year before August? Well, that was the year we had the bad brew come out of Milwaukee. And we so and so and so. I couldn't take time. What about the year before? He said, I don't remember that year. I said, but you don't remember a vacation, do you? No. And turned to the group. I said, how many of you took four weeks or more? Not a hand went up. How many of you took two weeks or more? Not a hand went up. How many of you took one week or more? Two of the vice presidents raised their hands. August leaned over the table, looked at the vice president, said, what's the matter with you guys? Why don't you take your vacations? <laughs> I said, August, you answer that. He looked at me and he turned cherry red. And oh my God. He said, you mean to say they don't take their vacations because I don't take mine. They think I'm going to hold it against them if they do. I said, you got it. He said, I'm sorry. He said, I had no idea I was having that effect on you. I promise you I will take at least four weeks and I want each of you to promise the same thing. Now, that's about 25 years ago and they have ever since. Nobody's ever taken less than four weeks since then. You see, that changes the relationship between the boss and the subordinates. The second one was funnier than the first. They said, August, they want more freedom to change the budget once you've approved of it. They said, give me an example. I said, okay, they have a computer on their budget. They decided they don't want a computer. They want to instead to spend money on a telecommunication equipment. And they got to come to you for approval. And that's silly because you don't know a damn thing either about computers or telecommunication equipment. <laughs> he said, Russ, they don't need my approval for that. I said, yes, they do, August. He said, Russ, you've been here a long time. And you know an awful lot about what I do, but you don't know everything. Believe me, they do not require my approval for that. At which point his secretary, who's taking notes of the meeting, Mickey, leans over and whispers to us. His face opens up and he says, I do? <laughs> so in the pile of stuff she gives him and he signs without ever reading it. He said, that's nonsense, let's eliminate that requirement. So you see, you go through a set of issues like that and you completely change the nature of the culture. The most startling one I ever had was in Imperial Oil of Canada, which is SO Canada. We did a study for that corporation, which led to the creation of a new business and a new division called EGL, SO Gas Liquids. It was a division that made and marketed propane, butane, and gas liquids. Peterson, who was the CEO, appointed a new president of that division, and they pulled this is that one out of the hat. He pulled a young planner from the corporate planning department. Uh, and made him president of the division, then appointed eight vice presidents, each of whom was older than the president, and each of whom had more experience in gas liquids than the president did. Uh, the corporation set up that division. The young president had worked with us in all this stuff in a different context, so the first thing he did was put these boards into operation. About two months after he did that, he called me one day. 
He said, Russ, it's not working. He said, it's disastrous. Those board meetings are the most bitter and vituperative things you've ever seen. Everybody's biting each other. They're competing with each other. We can't reach a decision on any issue that comes up. They're just miserable. Something is fundamentally wrong. He said, can you help me? I said, I don't know, but can I meet with your subordinates separately? He said, yep. So a meeting was set up with eight vice presidents who reported to him. I explained the rules. You're going to come up with a list of suggestions. It's going to tell him what he can do to enable you to do your job better. And boy, they went at it. 42 suggestions they came out with. They prioritized them. They said, you're not going to present this. We are. And then they went out. You'll take the first, the second, the third, the fourth, fifth, and then you'll take the seventh, the eighth, and ninth. They went around each one. You wound up with three or four suggestions that they were going to present. They rehearsed the presentation. We met in the boardroom, and they started to make their presentations. After about the fourth or fifth presentation, to all of which the young president agreed immediately, the oldest member of the room stopped and said, wait a minute, hold them, everything. He turned to Dan, the president, said, I have to make a confession. He said, you know, I resented your appointment. I thought I should have had your job. I'm older than you are. I've been around this company longer than you have, and I know this business better than you do. And so I've resented your appointment like hell. And I've been doing everything I can think of to make you look bad so that you would be replaced by me. He said, sitting here listening to you react to our suggestions make me realize that you're not responsible for your appointment. Bob Peterson, the CEO, is. He's a guy I ought to be sore at. But here I am trying to make you look bad, and it makes the division look bad, and I suffer as well as you. So I want you to know that that's an end of my efforts to get you kicked out. And then said, Jim, I can't tell you how glad I am to hear that. He said, you may not be aware of it, but I knew what you were trying to do, so I was trying to get you removed. <laughs> he said, I hadn't succeeded yet, but I was getting closer, and I'm going to call that off. And then the meeting stopped, and it became a born-again meeting. Went around the room with everybody confessing his sins, committing themselves to cooperation, and they walked out of there a different management team than they came in the room and it became the most profitable division of Imperial Oil with the best management team in the company. So democratization isn't just a fancy word, it's a way for improving efficiency and effectiveness of a management confronted by subordinates who know how to do their jobs better than management does, and where problems do not fall into silos but involve interactions of units. All right internal market economy. Here we are in a nation where the market economy is worshipped because following Adam Smith and various modifications we've made in his theory, we believe that the most effective economy is one that's controlled by the market, not by a central power such as the Soviet Union had. In the Soviet Union, all prices were set at the top was price that controlled demand. Demand did not control price in the Soviet Union. All decisions were centralized. And we wound up with a curious situation. The Soviet Union could not produce worth a damn, but it distributed fairly equitably. As a result, it wound up distributing poverty instead of wealth. We wound up extremely efficient in producing wealth, but completely inefficient in distributing it. We have a maldistribution of wealth that's getting worse every year, a greater and greater concentration of wealth in a smaller and smaller percentage of the population. In fact, that's a central problem in the world. The distribution of wealth, not only within nations, but between nations, is getting worse. So we have a strength and a weakness of both types of system. Why, if we believe that the market economy is so good at the national level, don't we use it at the corporate level? Well, the answer the economists used to give was, you can't tell it, they're different sizes. You know, how can you compare the economy of the United States to the economy of the corporation? Well, lo and behold, look at what happened. Two things. In the 20 largest economies in the world, 
Four of them are corporations. AT&T is larger than 15 different countries' economy. Furthermore, they don't operate anymore within national boundaries. They're global. Therefore, the explanation for the difference in the economic structure on the basis of size or boundaries is nonsense. So the question comes up, why not try a market economy internally? What does that mean? Inside the corporation, any unit can buy or sell what it wants to, wherever it wants to, at whatever price it's willing to do it. A higher level of authority can override any decision to buy or sell outside. But if I make you buy outside something that you could buy outside cheaper than you can get it from the inside unit, I have to pay you for the difference. So that no unit will ever have to pay more or receive more for anything it buys or sells than it would if we're completely in a completely free economy. But we have a regulated freedom. The regulation is whenever a decision will hurt the whole, and that's what the superior manager's responsibility is, he can override a free market decision that will hurt the whole. It's exactly what we did at the national level. During World War II, IBM was not permitted to sell its computers to, this, to the enemy. I suspect that Boeing was not allowed to sell aircraft to certain countries. So in the interest of the whole, regulations are imposed. And so the market economy is the same. Now what happens inside of a corporation is unbelievable. You see, most corporations are full of monopolies. Monopolistic suppliers of services or goods. Two things happen with the monopoly. They don't give a damn about their customers because the customers don't have any choice. So they become unbelievably inefficient. Now you've got to ask yourself the following question. How does the top management evaluate the performance of a monopoly? You can't do it by the share of the market because the, they have the whole market, internal market. How do they do it? Well, I'll tell you how they do it. They do it by the size of the monopoly. The larger the internal service unit is, the harder it is to replace with an outside unit. Therefore, what's the principal objective of the accounting department, the computing department, the uh, duplicating department, the building and grounds department? To become as big as they possibly can because the bigger they are, the harder they will be to replace. They try to make work and that's what creates a bureaucracy because a bureaucratic monopoly is the most inefficient kind of monopoly. The beauty of a market economy is it does not allow such monopolies to develop because anybody who needs a service has the possibility of getting it outside if they want to or wants to sell a product, they can sell it externally if they want to. I don't have time to give you examples. There are all sorts of corporations that have made this conversion. It also transforms the nature of reactions inside the corporation and increases their efficiency Unbelievably, I told you about the Clark case where transportation was moved outside the corporation and they reduced transportation costs by about $20 million a year. Where at Eastman Kodak, they moved it out to joint ventures and saved 40% of the cost of computing and telecommunications. By bringing market economy in, you get in incredible increases in effectiveness. Now, this is just saying what I just said. Okay, what am I doing wrong here? Oh. The next point I had was on organizational structure. Uh, see, I don't think I have the quote here, but I had one last year. No, I don't have it. Petronius, who was a philosopher at the time of Nero, uh, had a wonderful quotation, which I used to have on this thing, but I guess I inadvertently cut it off. It said that every time management has a problem, they solve it by reorganizing. And reorganization gives the illusion of progress while retarding it. So the question comes up, is there any way of avoiding reorganization? Well, you can't do that until you know why people reorganize. Well, reorganization is a form of adaptation to changing conditions. So something changes in the environment, you reorganize. AT&T is deregulated 
no longer a monopoly, and suddenly marketing becomes very important. It wasn't before. And so they have to reorganize and take into account the changing environment. So can we adapt to changing conditions without reorganizing? Well, that was a question raised by a man by the name of Goggin, believe it or not, G-O-G-G-I-N, who was president of Dow Corning, who asked this question. He found the solution to it. It involved understanding what an organization is. See, there are two essential characteristics of an organization. The first is a functional division of labor. If we're six of us in a van that stalls on a highway, and all six of us get out and stand in the back of the van and push, we are not organized, we're associated, because we're all doing the same thing. If one stays in the car to steer it, one gets out in the road to wave the other cars away, and four push, we've organized. Organization involves a division of labor functionally. Now, once you divide labor functionally, you have to coordinate it. Now, depending on the number of divisions that you've made, you get layer of layer, you get coordinators of the coordinators, and so on up to various levels. So it's two things that create an organization, the functional division of labor, which is the division of responsibility, and the division of coordination, which is the vertical authority dimension in an organization chart. How do we divide labor, says Coggin? Well, it turns out fascinatingly, I think, that every organization, for-profit, not-for-profit, government, not-for-government, any organization, a hospital, a school, a corporation, only have three ways of dividing labor. One, by inputs. Now, input is a function. So these are parts of an organization whose output is consumed inside the organization. Accounting. Hmm? The people that use the accounting are other departments of the corporation. Data processing is usually input internally. Maintenance of the building is input oriented. These are called input units. Output units are units whose output is consumed primarily outside the organization. So General Motors, this is the Chevrolet division, the Pontiac division, the Buick division, the Cadillac division, the Hummer division, and so on. They're defined by product or service, which is sold externally and produces the income to the company. The third division is by user, by market. So IBM has a North American division, a Latin American division, a European division, a Near East division, and so on. That's dividing the market up. Or Sears has catalog buyers, retail buyers, wholesale buyers, ways of dividing the users up. Only three criteria, input, output, and users. Every organization has all three. But when you draw an organization chart, the typical tree diagram, you start at the top with the CEO, you come down to the first level of vice presidents. How do you divide the labor among the vice presidents? Well, in most companies, you pick one of those three criteria, and it's the most relevant to your current state of the business. You may use two, but usually it's only one. Functionally, AT&T, before deregulation, was organized functionally. Production, maintenance, accounting, finance, and so on. The next level, they could organize by product or service. And the next one, by market. In every organization, if you examine the organization chart, you will find that the three criterion, input, output, and user, are ranked in order of importance, depending on the nature of the business. So marketing was the least important in AT&T when it was a monopoly. But the moment it was deregulated, what happened? Had to start to compete. Marketing had to be moved up. Hence, the largest reorganization in American history. 51% of its managers were moved from one city to another at the cost of hundreds of millions of dollars. So Goggin said, why don't we put units of all three types at each level of an organization? So that at every level of an organization, we have input units, output units, and user units. Then when the environment changes, instead of changing the structure, you change the allocation of resources. If marketing becomes more important, then put more investment in marketing. If production is more important, put the investment in production, and so on. By reallocating resources, you eliminate the need to reorganize. 
And that came to be called the multidimensional organization. It's not the matrix organization, it's not zero-based budgeting. It's an organization where at every level you have three different types of unit, input, output, and user. And where all of the adaptation takes place by the reallocation of resources among the three. That also is written up in detail in the book. Now, this is the one I want to spend most time on here. Organizational learning. Uh, we've begun to learn a lot about learning, and we realize we've known very little about it. This is one of the surprising things we've learned. There are five different kinds of things you can learn, and that distinction is very seldom made. There's data, information, knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. These are five different things. The significance of this division is shown in this old educational aphorism. An ounce of information is worth a pound of data. An ounce of knowledge is worth a pound of information. An ounce of understanding is worth a pound of knowledge. An ounce of wisdom is worth a pound of understanding. If you're interested, it makes an ounce of wisdom worth little more than 65,000 ounces of data. Now, the unfortunate thing is that corporations and educational system allocate time to these five categories inversely related to their importance. Most time is spent on collecting data and information, a little bit on knowledge, and only recently have we started to talk about knowledge management. Who ever heard of a corporation talking about understanding management or wisdom management? They don't even know what these things are. So let's look at that. Data consists of symbols that represent the properties of objects and events. So if you have a name tag in front of you, you have alphabetic symbols which represent a property of you. They're the name by which you're called. If I ask each of you to take a sheet of paper and put down your age so I can calculate the average age of this group, the numbers that you give me, I assume each of you would give me two digits. <laughs> I add them up and divide by the number and I come out with an average. The numbers you give me are data. They are symbols that represent a property of you, your age. Your birth date. Are you married or yes, yes or no? That's another set of symbols. These are all properties of you. Data is nothing but properties of objects and events. Data are absolutely useless until they've been processed into information. The easiest analogy to use is this. Data is like iron ore. What can you make out of iron ore? Hmm? Nothing except iron. Once you've made iron out of iron ore, you can do an infinite number of things. Information is like iron. Data is like iron ore. Information is what is contained in descriptions. Who is in this room? How many are in this room? Where did they come from? When did they arrive? This is all descriptive material. When you answer any of these questions, you're describing this group, and that's information. But now if the person who enters at the reception desk says, how do I get this meeting that Aikoff is talking to? They're asking for instructions. They're raising a question that begins with how to. How to questions require instruction, and instructions contain knowledge. That's not information. Information is who, what, where, when. Knowledge is how to. So if you say, where is New York relative to Philadelphia? It's information, it's easy. It's 92 miles to the north and slightly to the east. What's the best way to drive from Philadelphia to New York? They're asking for instructions now. That's knowledge. Knowledge is the ability to get what you want efficiently. Now, if you say to me, why the hell do you want to go to New York? You're not asking for instructions. You're asking for a reasoning, understanding is contained in explanations, answers to the question that begins with why. So why do I want to go to New York? This is a higher level of, of 
comprehension than knowledge. But the biggest thing is wisdom. You see, data information, knowledge, and understanding are all concerned with efficiency, doing things right. Wisdom is concerned with doing the right thing. So coming back to Peter Drucker, when he talks about doing things right, that's all data, information, knowledge, and understanding. When he's talking about doing the right thing, he's talking about wisdom. It's doing the right thing, and now you get doing the wrong thing, righter makes you wronger. Making a mistake, doing the wrong thing, correcting it makes you wronger. And therefore, the compulsion should be to find out what's the right thing to do. Somebody was saying, they just came from a session, I don't remember who it was, where the whole focus was on maximizing shareholder value, right? That's not only the wrong thing, it's not even the real thing. I have never seen a corporation, and I've been in more than 400 of them, that tries to maximize shareholder value. That's a myth perpetrated by management to impress the shareholders. What is a corporation really about? Not maximizing shareholder value. What's a university about? Education of students? Well, that's you talk about myths. <laughs> I sat in faculty meetings for the first two years I joined Pennsylvania, and it was so boring I kept a record of the topics discussed, and the word student was mentioned twice in two years. University is not about teaching students. It's about providing the faculty with the quality of work life they want. <laughs> teaching is a price they got to pay. <laughs> it, they, therefore, they try to minimize the price, which is what they do. You go to Harvard and you find out they teach three hours a year. Go to Kent State, which is a much inferior institution, they teach 30 hours a year. The moral is clear, the less teaching, the better the school. But we don't operate on that principle. But a university is about maximizing the quality of work life of the faculty. Student learning is only incidental. What's a corporation about? Not about maximizing shareholder value. General Electric hired one of the best management scientists in the United States a number of years ago when Fred Borch was the CEO. And he asked me to help him find the best free management scientists in the country. And I hired a fellow from out here, the Rand Corporation, named George Feeney. And Dr. George came and joined GE. He was assigned to an office a couple doors down from Fred Borch's. And when he came to the company, he came in to see Fred. He said, now, what's my job? And Fred said, that's up to you to tell me. He said, you can look around, do anything you want in a corporation. And when you find something that needs to be done that you think you can do, do it. And George said, you must be kidding. He said, no, that's what I want you to do. OK, he said. So George went out. And the first thing he did is collect the propaganda the company puts out, and including a pamphlet on corporate objectives. You all seen those kinds of things? Maximize shareholder value. Be a good corporate a citizen. Provide employees with challenging and rewarding work. And on and on and on through motherhood, right? <laughs> he collected the decisions made in the corporations over the last five years and checked them against the list of objectives. And every single one of them violated at least one of the corporate objectives. Now, he said, there's only two possible explanations. Either these guys are stupid, or these are not the objectives. Now, he said, I know these managers. I've gotten to know them. And they're certainly not stupid. Therefore, these are not the corporate objectives. How can I find out what the corporate objectives actually are? Now, he did an absolutely ingenious thing, which I wish had been published. I can only talk about it now because Fred Borch is unfortunately dead, and George Feeney has disappeared. I don't know where he is. He found that 95% of the decisions made in a corporation were justified by one objective that wasn't on the list. To maximize the standard of living and quality of life of the people who made the decision. That's what corporations are about. And all you have to do is look at Enron and these other places, you see it. It's there conspicuously. 
They're not running Enron for the benefit of shareholders. They're running for their own benefit. Now, we can go on with the myth about shareholder value, but that is a myth and a self-deception, and you can't be efficient trying to do the wrong thing righter. We have to start to understand what a corporation's objective ought to be and ought to be development, as we said, and maximizing development will produce the greatest returns to all the stakeholders and not just the shareholders. Now, remember I said you can't learn by doing something right? You can only learn by identifying mistakes and correcting them. But all through school, you were taught that making a mistake is a bad thing and you learn how to hide them or disclaim them. And certainly we get in the corporation, you don't go around and say, hey, look at this mistake I made. Not if you want to keep your job. So you conceal mistakes, and therefore you suppress the possibility of learning. Now, notice a couple things about mistakes. First, there are two kinds of mistakes. One is when you do something you should not have done. Eastman Kodak bought Sterling drug, it shouldn't have done it. Not doing something you should have done. They didn't buy Xerox when they could have. They didn't buy Fuji when they could have. Two kinds of mistakes, errors of commission and errors of omission. Now here's a question for you. Look at the corporations that ran into serious trouble and survived. IBM in the 80s, Eastman Kodak, Sears and Roebuck, and so on, or Enron. Did they run into trouble because of what they did or because of what they didn't do? Which is the more serious type of error? Well, why did IBM run into trouble? What did they do that got them into trouble? Nothing. It's what they didn't do. What didn't they do? They paid no attention to the small computer. They stuck with the mainframe until the bulk of the business had moved over to the smaller computers and then they tried to buy their way in. And luckily they got Gerstner who saved the corporation, otherwise they would have gone under. What's happened to Eastman Kodak? We were discussing it during the break. It's not what they did, they bought Sterling Drug, they never should have done it. They sold it at a $2 billion loss, but they still could survive that. What they can survive is what? Digital photography. Because I was there when they consciously decided that's a waste of effort. Decided not to do something. That's what killed. Sears and Robot got into trouble because they said, Walmart, that won't last. It's a discount house, <laughs> you know, pay, pay no attention to it. And so it didn't. Now, two kinds of errors, errors of commission, errors of omission. Now here's the next question. Your accounting system takes account of only one of those two types of errors. Which one? Commission. If you do something you shouldn't have done, you buy sterling drugs, it'll show in the book when you write it off, right? Or in a loss of money, or a loss of a division. When they don't buy Xerox, where does that show in the books? Nowhere. Nowhere. So the most serious types of error don't get recorded. Now you're a manager in a company in which making a mistake is a bad thing and the only kind of mistake you can get caught on is doing something you shouldn't have done. What's your best strategy to maximize job security? You got it. You were asking me why corporations don't change, you now have the answer. Because of the way you treat mistakes. The only way that can be changed is to recognize that learning takes place through the identification of mistakes and correcting them and learning from the corrections. And no corporations, or virtually none, go through that process. The few that do absolutely shoot ahead. I'll give you a, one example. The first system that I'm going to describe in a moment that was built on the identification of errors was built at Anheuser-Busch way back in the early 1960s. It was built for the marketing department. At that time, Anheuser-Busch had the market divided into 192 market areas. Uh, in each market area, they marketed all their products. At that time, there were 42 combinations of product package. 
They were the largest brewer in the United States. They had 9.4% of the market. Schlitz at that time was number two with 8.6%. When this system was installed, marketing management had to go into retreat for a month to make explicit the following decisions for each of the 192 market areas. For advertising, how much to spend on advertising, what media mix to use, what timing on the media, what programs on the media, and what message to deliver. All those advertising decisions, they had to make them consciously. Pricing decision for each product package combination. It was called point of sales, display of the material at the retail point. Sales effort, sales calls on the customers. What have I left out? One other promotional activity, giveaways, promotions, and things of that sort. A whole set of decisions for each of 192 areas. The, the variable predicted was the change in market share by each market area. In the first month, 192, there were 45 significant errors. Okay? They had to go to work immediately to find the cause of those errors. It was a little over 35 of them they could find the reason for immediately. For example, how many of you have ever been to Fort Smith, Arkansas? You know, it used to have a very large uh, army base there. Remember Camp Chaffee, Arkansas? That month, Camp Chaffee was closed. The PX was closed. This had a tremendous impact on the sale of beer. This is an error due to a change that had not been anticipated but was now permanent. So the next month they took this change into account in forecasting. Okay? They didn't make that mistake twice. In another case, a wholesaler, the distributor died, his sons took over the business and closed it for two weeks. So they had no deliveries for two weeks, but then they reopened. That's a temporary change, so they could go back to the old forecasting method. For 35 of them, they were able to get this explanation. The remainder they carried over to the next month, but they had fewer mistakes the next month. In 18 months, the system stabilized in an average of no more than four mistakes a month out of 192. The average error was reduced to one-eighth of what it had been 18 months ago, and market share increased from 9.4 to 16.2%. That system has been retained, and today, you know what Anheuser-Busch market share is? 51% of the market, the largest brewer in the world. They say, jokingly, but true, they spill more beer than anybody else makes. <laughs> and that's almost true. Why? It's simple. They learn because they systematically control mistakes and insist on learning from them. Look, when you make a mistake and you correct it, you're making a decision, right? If you take that decision to correct the mistake and run controls on those decisions, how many of them worked and how many of them didn't? You are now learning how to correct mistakes. That is learning how to learn. That has a technical name, it's called Deutero learning. And so you go from linear learning like this to exponential learning like that, when you have a system which learns how to learn as well as to learn. So this business with mistakes is not an academic subject. It's one of the most important single things a corporation can do almost immediately, is to begin to record every decision, including decisions not to do something. Because when you say, I'm not going to do something, that's just as much a decision as when you say you are going to do something, and tracking that. An example, a short, well, not too short a while ago, the Grand Old Opry came up for sale. Anheuser-Busch was interested. And so they looked at it, and they came up with an amount they were willing to pay for it. And I told them, that's nonsense. Don't even bother to submit that bid. They said, why? They said, you're estimating what it's worth. He said, of course. How else will you do it? He said, you have to estimate what it would be worth if you owned it. He said, what's the difference? He said, the difference is what you intend to do with it. Nobody ever gets a corporation for what it's worth. 
You get it for what you think its value will be after you do what you can do, do to it. Well, they didn't pay any attention. A guy bought it with a bid that was more than twice what Anheuser-Busch had submitted. When he did that, August said to me, you see, I told you, that guy cannot possibly make any money out of the Grand Old Opry at the price he paid for it. He will never pay off that loan to buy that corporation. I asked him if he wanted to bet. He wasn't willing to bet me. But that guy got a higher return on the capital employed than Anheuser-Busch did within a year because he knew what he was going to do with it. He wasn't simply going to accept it and run it the way it had been running. So making a mistake and learning from it is critical. I can tell you Anheuser-Busch has never subsequently tried to buy anybody by estimating what its current value is and offering to buy that value. The only acquisitions you ever get is when you're willing to pay more for something than it's worth, because you can make it worth more. And if you can't make it worth more, you wouldn't buy it. That's the only excuse for buying it is that you can increase its value. Business Week ran an issue a while back on what's called the breakup value of the firm. Are you familiar with that concept? They asked the following question. Suppose you take a firm like Boeing and break it up into its divisions. You have a number, do you? you have commercial, you have aircraft, you have space, and so on. What could you sell each one of those divisions separately for on the market? So you estimate what you think you could get. Then you estimate what you think you could get for the corporation as a whole. Now, they actually did this for Eastman Kodak, which was interesting. By selling the division separately, they could get eight times as much money as they could by selling the corporation as a whole. That's called negative synergy. Mm -hmm. The only excuse for having those divisions in the company is that you make them more valuable than they would be if they were separate. Now, Jim Reinhardt, who I mentioned earlier at Owen Clark Equipment, understood this, and he did some interesting things. The company, as I told you, was in serious trouble. And therefore, its credit division, which did the financing and mortgaging of all the heavy equipment that sold, because it was all bought on credit. You buy a piece of equipment worth a quarter of a million dollars, you don't pay cash for it. Uh, they were having trouble because when the company was in financial trouble, their credit rating went down, and the credit company had to borrow money using company credit rating. So Jim Reinhardt figured out if they took the credit division of the company, spun it off as a separate corporation, it would get a better credit rating than the corporation did, and they could have that new company do the financing of their sales at a lower price than they could when they were inside the corporation. They did that. And they created a very, very profitable credit corporation. See, So it depends on what you conceive of the role of the corporation to be relative to its units. Is it adding to their value or detracting from it? We had the funniest one I ever ran into was in Alcoa. When Charlie Parry was CEO of Alcoa, he decided he wanted to diversify into high tech. So a group of us working on this found two high tech companies, small ones, out here in California for him. They were each earning 23% return on capital employed, which was one hell of a lot more than Alcoa was. So Alcoa paid a fancy price, but this was an investment in the future. At the end of the first year, Perry called us in and said, something's happened to those companies. They're only earning about 8% on capital employed. What have they done since we bought them? So we went out to find out, can you guess what we found? They were doing exactly the same business they had done before. What was the difference? The allocation of corporate overhead. When they started to carry corporate overhead, their earnings on the capital went way down. So that corporation was not adding to the value of its components, it was detracting from them. And fortunately, they sold them both at a profit. And they were better off than the two companies were as well. Okay, we have a few minutes before we take a break. Let's take one or two questions and then we'll switch over. Any questions you got on this? Yeah. Just curious, out of the companies, the 400 companies or more that you Work with which ones would you say are the most progressive? And you know, if you can name a handful of 
Yeah, a lot of them are named in the book, but that, that's easy. Uh, Allied, which is Armco Latin American Division, was a remarkable organization. And North Coast Energy is another one, Anheuser-Busch. I can keep naming them. Uh, the White House Communication Agency. Uh, the uh, Sisters of Charity of Nazareth Hospital Chain. And on and on they go. Permitting everyone to do whatever they want to do, providing it doesn't affect any other. Is that possible in the system? Why not? Seems like through the interactions that what I do somehow will affect. Well, the workers at Alcoa decided to repaint the locker room. How did that affect anybody else? They decided to allow the wives to come into the grounds and sit at the picnic tables and have lunch with them. Didn't affect anybody else. It sure as hell had a big effect on morale, on their, on them, but didn't affect anybody else. Okay. There are all kinds of changes any individual unit can make that don't affect other units. They're not usually the most important things they're doing, but they're things which have a major impact on quality of work life. For example, one of the most important things Alcoa did in Tennessee was to have a children's day where all the workers were allowed to bring their kids in for a day so the kids could see what their daddies did. Boy, I can't tell you what that did for productivity. The company had a picnic for the kids. The parents and the kids would have lunch together with hot dogs and barbecue and stuff like that. And they'd work besides daddy during the day while he did his normal job. And they had him in protective clothing and all that kind of stuff. But that's the kind of things that get done that have a tremendous impact, doesn't affect anybody else. We have a compulsion for consistency. Everybody has to do everything the same way. Uh, I remember at the University of Pennsylvania had a beautiful one. Uh, the University of Pennsylvania is a large research organization, and its principal client is the US government, and it's the health division of the government that's its biggest client. So every three years, a committee of HEW come up to Penn to renegotiate the contract which set the overhead rate the university was allowed to charge. This was a year in which the government said no increase in overheads because we're on an economy drive, but the committee had to come up anyhow. The three years were up. They came up to Penn and discovered that they were underpaying Penn by about 20%. So we were subsidizing the government. They couldn't change the overhead rate. So they put their heads together and came up with a marvelous solution. Overhead was applied to professor salary spent on research projects. All other expenses were directly charged. You didn't overhead secretaries or travel or computing time. That was all direct charges. The committee said you can overhead all indirect charges. And that amounted to a 20% increase in income, but it didn't change the overhead rate. Is that clear? University was tickled pink. Next day, the finance vice president puts out a memo. All research in the university will now charge the fixed rate, which happened to be 65% overhead, but it will now be applied to all expenses on a project. Well, I saw this and I became ill. I called the vice president of finance immediately. I said, you just put us out of business. He said, what are you talking about? So I'm one of 14 research units in the Wharton School. But we do more travel than the other 13 groups put together. For example, I remember the number. For last year, for Anheuser-Busch, we spent $72,000 for airline tickets. Do you think they're going to allow me to put a 65% overhead on that? Don't be crazy. He paused. He said, you're right. He said, you can't do that. I said, good. Let's go back to the old system. He said, we can't do that. Why not? He said, because we can only work with one accounting system in the university. We can't have two different accounting systems. He said, you're going to have to solve it some other way. Well, we did. That's not the point. What we did is open up contracts with a travel agent that was directly with each one of our sponsors, so they paid the travel agent for our indirect costs. 
and then we didn't have to overhead it. So we evade the university rules, but evaded the purpose of it. See? But the point is, this demand for consistency leads to an incredible amount of ineffectiveness and inefficiency. Instead of treating the need for each unit as a distinctive thing, allowing them to do what they want to do, providing it doesn't affect anybody else. I had, I, you know, I can tell you stories on that. There's one I love, I'll tell you. I, university called, created a committee to investigate the payment of graduate students who worked on research projects. The reason was that a professor of labor management relations, Bill Gomberg, who was a good friend of mine, believed that we overpaid our graduate students. We were paying our graduate students more than any other graduate students in the university. Our argument was they had to travel, they had to be away a lot, because our projects are not done in-house, they have to be done at the companies. So they formed this committee to investigate compensation for graduate students. I was subpoenaed. <laughs> First day of the committee meeting, I come in, and there's a committee sitting around a table, I'm at the end, and Bill Gomberg says to me, Russell, you know what this committee exists for? I said, yeah. You want to equalize graduate student payments. He said, that's right. He said, what do you think about that? I said, I think it's a great idea. He said, well, wait a minute, you don't understand. I said, what do you mean I don't understand? He said, we're talking about making all the graduate students get the same amount of money. You mean to say you approve of that? I said, yeah, but you're making an assumption I don't make. He said, well, justified or not, but is it the same or not? Bureaucrats are terrible. They can't stand a variety greater than one. <laughs> okay, let's take a break.